So it's tough for everyone, whether you're on the inside of business or you're on the outside. I worked for Nike for half of my career so far, so about 15 years. So this, versions of this question came up multiple times over that period. And my view on this now, especially now, is that it is no longer a choice. I want to talk to you about power today and where the balance of it sits. There's a new force in the marketplace and it decides whether a business succeeds or fails, how fast and by how much. Meet the new CEOs, consumers, employees, and outsiders. They can make or break a business faster than ever before in history. Consumers include B2B, employees past, present, or future. Twitter does not discriminate. And outsiders are that large, diverse group of players that in business we've liked to keep at a quite comfortable arm's length distance government, civil society, regulatory players, industry bodies. Thanks to a long era of profit as purpose and extreme short-termism, this crowd of new CEOs no longer trusts us. And thanks to a social media and digital revolution, they can now do something about it. Now, I do not hand the most important title in the corporate sector over lightly. I do it to signal the power shift. Consumers have taken control, and it's going to stay that way. 92% of them will read an online review today before making a purchasing decision, meaning that their opinions of us in business are more valuable or more expensive than ever. 70% of them will turn to Facebook or Twitter to get customer service attention, meaning that our complaints can no longer be contained as they once were in the past. Now, Employees, well, they've always been a number, they've sometimes been a name, but now they are a voice. And they can speak freely on social media platforms about your business without fear of retaliation. They are now the most trusted voice to speak on behalf of a company. And that can either be a huge advantage for a company or a real pain in the neck, actually. So outsiders, that large group of diverse stakeholders that I talked about, they're going to make red tape or they're going to cut it. They're going to be watchdogs or wonderfully supportive endorsers. Today, civil society can rally a protest and secure wins against a company in a matter of minutes, hours and days, no longer years and decades. This dynamic of stakeholders being for or against a company, it's not particularly new. What is new is that the potency and velocity of it is like nothing we've ever seen before or had to handle in the corporate sector. And when this collective group gets organised, they are unstop unstoppable. If they don't trust a business, if they don't believe a business, if they don't like what the business stands for, they're going to make life very, very difficult. And what I want to do is take you outside of the food system for just a minute so that you can see this really clearly and give you three examples of how this is playing out. So, gun control. Led by the surviving students of the Florida school shooting back in February, it took less than 15 days for once disparate advocacy groups, gun advocacy groups, to come together and put unprecedented pressure on any business that had a direct or indirect link with the gun industry. So companies that were giving deep discounts to National Rifle Association members came under huge fire, and these were big companies, airlines, banks, insurance companies. Those companies severed ties and stopped the discount programs, and that's just one example of how this uprising of students created the right type of pressure in order to move big business. It's nothing less than extraordinary. Now, this is an example in the sports industry of this new power of employees. This is just one of many recent articles exposing Nike's boys' club culture. The women at Nike spoke up on the impact of the boys' club on their career development, their career options, their well-being and the overall workplace dynamic. And now it's out there for the whole world to see in quite a matter of detail. Nike's executive leadership had no option but to take immediate, very material and very public action. Now, this is something that just, as, an, as a former Nike employee, just did not feel possible or even probable. And I know with Nike's track record, actually, uh, they've got a pretty good track record standing up for social issues, so I know that they'll work to get this one right. So in transport, 
Uber has definitely shaken up the system there. But they did it in a way that had absolute disregard for so many of the things that we care about. Fair pay, workers' rights, basic public safety. So now they wear a huge target on the back of their back for those new CEOs, the crowd to point at. And the crowd are creating huge headwinds for Uber to now face into. Uber has been banned from at least 10 countries at this point. And you may be familiar that uh, London recently pulled their license. Uber have a lot of work to do to get that license back and it's their most lucrative market. So my point with these three cases is that influencing big business today is actually more possible than ever, especially if you get organised. But there is a better way to get what we all want from business, and this is where I focus. Identify the more inspired companies and fuel them like the future depends on it. A few of us have spent about four years clarifying and really studying and writing down, pulling together a methodology about what we mean by this. This is the first time actually I'm speaking publicly about it, so I'm looking forward to some feedback. <laughs> and uh, here's a quick preview. Inspired companies do three things particularly well, and the first thing they do well is they have an inspired mission, a purpose with many winners. Inspired companies stand for big ideas. For example, to accelerate the advent of sustainable energy to organise the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, to help people do more, feel better, live longer, to inspire and innovate for every athlete in the world, and if you have a body, you're an athlete. Now, as I've just pointed out, none of these brands are perfect, but their mission gives them a distinct advantage at the start line to bring that crowd of new CEOs on side to help them get that mission done. And it's the first place to look for clues as to who you want to get behind. Turning those big words into action, though, is everything. And this is the hardest part because companies today are not wired to deliver those big, ambitious, shared ideas. Companies today are wired to deliver those internal, narcissistic facing goals. The most popular mission statement over the last 70 to 80 years has been to be the number one in your industry. We want to be the best car maker or the, you know, the best sports company in the world. So these bigger statements require so much more help to get done from consumers, employees and outsiders. So no company is doing this perfectly, but if you look at enough examples, you can start to see patterns. And many of, many of the companies have parts of the answer. So we took a lot of time to develop a roadmap around this to help businesses transition to become this type of company. And this is just a tiny glimpse of what an inspired or what inspired action looks like. So Tesla, for example, questioned the three-year 30,000 mile warranty norm that has existed in the car industry for almost forever. They created their own eight-year infinite mile warranty, and they did that because the old warranty norm got in the way of pursuing their mission. And if you think about it, they had to completely rethink how global manufacturing and production norms were going to change in order to deliver against that warranty. And now, really importantly, we're seeing commitments from the larger, bigger companies to transition over to clean energy cars and ditch the fossil fuel. So not long ago, this was unthinkable, but big business have moved and Tesla's leadership has been key to that. Now, Gunhild, at the opening of this session, directed us to sit at different tables and Christiana said to come up with surprising alliances, so let's talk about chocolate for a minute. Tony Chocolonely's is an incredible chocolate company based out of Amsterdam and they're relatively young. Uh, their mission is to make 100% slave-free the norm in chocolate. Now, their commitment to the SDGs goes well beyond that, but their sharp point is ending slavery in chocolate. Their bars, as you can see, are unequally divided because they want to take an opportunity at every turn to send a signal that the benefits of the industry are also unequally divided. They published research that another larger chocolate company dropped when that larger company found out the, that the research was saying that things are getting worse in the industry, not better. They have refused to sell out to bigger companies when they've been made offers to buy, to buy them. And instead, they set up an internal team to help the big companies copy them. They're actually encouraging imitation. 
They're doing very well financially. The crowd of new CEOs is giving them huge tailwinds. They're now 20% of Holland's market. They've expanded into nine international markets. Revenue has increased 22 times in eight years. They are authentically pursuing a mission. The crowd is getting behind them and they are transitioning the sector as a result. So, to the business leaders in the room, I think this is one of the most exciting times in history, actually, to run a business. You have a chance to run businesses in a way that pursues big ideas and do it in a way that recruits the world to help you deliver those ideas. For those that aren't in business, I hope you've seen that I've given you two ways to accelerate change in the food sector with business. The first one, sure, is take the, the confidence I'm giving you, get organised in new ways, take modern forms of advocacy, get your asks clear, and the wins will come faster than ever and more probably than ever. The only thing I'd say about that is that wins with the corporate sector that come through activism and pressure don't necessarily sustain or repeat. So I'd go here. Pick the more inspired companies. Share the same big idea. Put the new power that you have as consumers, employees and outsiders in their court. Help them to succeed and compete and they will transition the sectors that they sit within. And I do it like the future of the food system depends on it, because it does. Thanks very much. <laughs>